Hey, good evening, church family. It's so good to worship with you tonight. I want you to grab your Bibles, and I'd like for you to open up to Ezra chapter 3. <clears throat> Ezra chapter 3. Now, if you're just joining us, then we have been in a series on Sunday mornings called Rebuild, where we're going through the book of Nehemiah and looking at the way that Nehemiah rebuilt physically Jerusalem, but he was also rebuilding God's people in a lot of ways. And he was they were rebuilding the temple so that they could worship, and they were doing as God commanded, and he was fulfilling promises to them, and it was it's a really amazing story. And there's a guy named Ezra that is his contemporary. They're doing things kind of side by side, and so we're studying that on Wednesday nights. I want to read, last week we did uh, Ezra chapter 2, which uh, is, a, is a really cool study, a lot of really interesting foreshadowing that we see kind of presenting uh, ahead uh, for the New Testament. But we didn't read all of Ezra chapter 2. Ezra 3 is one that I want us to read. It's not incredibly long. Um, it's 13 verses. So I'd like for you to grab your Bibles and you can follow along with me uh, or, or just listen as I read it. But Ezra 3, verses 1 through the end of the chapter. So it says, In early autumn, when the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people assembled in Jerusalem with a unified purpose. Then Jeshua, son of Genazak, joined his fellow priest and Zerubbabel, son of Shantiel with his family in re rebuilding the altar of God of Israel. They wanted to sacrifice burnt offerings on it and instructed the law of Moses, the man of God, even though the people were afraid of the local residents. They rebuilt the altar at its old site. Then they began to sacrifice burnt offerings on the altar of the Lord each morning and each evening. They celebrated the festival of shelters as prescribed in the law, sacrificing the number of burnt offerings specified for each day of the festival. They also offered the regular burnt offerings and the offerings required for the new moon celebration and the annual festivals as prescribed by the Lord. The people also gave voluntary offerings to the Lord. Fifteen days before the festival shelters began, the priest had begun to sacrifice burnt offerings to the Lord. This was the way it was done and had started to lay the foundation of the Lord's temple. Then the people hired masons and carpenters and brought cedar logs from the people of Tyre and Sidon, paying them with food and wine and olive oil. The logs were brought down from the Lebanon mountains, floated along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea to Joppa, for King Cyrus had given permission for this. The construction of the temple of, of God began in mid-spring, during the second year after it arrived in Jerusalem. The workforce was made up of everyone who had returned from exile, including Zerubbabel, son Son of Shantiel, Jeshua, son of Jedadak, and his fellow priests and all the Levites. The Levites, who were 20 years old or older, were put in charge of rebuilding the Lord's temple. The workers at the temple of God were supervised by Jeshua and his sons and relatives, and Cadmiel and his sons, all descendants of Hadvorka. They had helped in the task by the Levites of the family of Hinnadad. Then the builders completed the foundation of the Lord's temple. The priests put on their robes and took their places to blow their trumpets, and the Levites, descendants of Aspa, clashed their cymbals to praise the Lord, just as King David had prescribed. With praise and thanks, they sang and, and this song to the Lord. He is good. His faithful love for Israel endures forever. Then... All the people gave a great shout, praising the Lord, because the foundation of the Lord's temple had been laid. But many of the older priests, Levites, and other leaders who had been seen, who had seen the first temple, wept aloud when they saw the new temple's foundation. The others, however, were shouting for joy. The joyful shouting and weeping mingled together in a loud noise that could be heard, that could be heard far in the distance. So we continue looking in Ezra chapter 3, and you see they, you know, again, they're rebuilding the temple, they're rebuilding the altar as a means to worship. But you notice they did something very particular. Even before they rebuilt the entire temple, which they're not to yet, they rebuilt the altar. And this is a very deliberate decision of why do they start with the altar? Because, of course, the altar, and they built it on its original site, um, again, to preserve in, in the Jewish mind, this is where it needed to be um, built, this is where God authorized it originally, so it's not to be moved anywhere. But why do they start with the altar? Because the altar is what is actually necessary for worship. Remember, Jewish worship back in the Old Testament is different than worship we have today. Um, some of the, the hearts of things, the reasons why are some somewhat similar, but the physical, of, of the process, the logistics of worship are very different. So, you know, at that time, of course, they had to offer offerings and sacrifices that could only happen on and at the altar. So they made a very deliberate decision. Again, 
is all of this, are, is everything we're doing a means to worship? They could have started anywhere, but they said, we're going to start with the altar because this is what we need to worship. We're not going to allow us to miss the forest for the trees, so to speak. You know, that project was so big. They, they're coming back. And, and if you think on a much grander scale, you know, they're coming back to an entire city that is just ransacked. But they're coming with the intentionality, the specific vision. Let's think back to Nehemiah here of we're going to focus on the temple. This is something we can get done. Let's do it. So, but even beyond that, they say we need to get the temple done, but our worship to God is first and foremost. All of this rebuilding project, this is not just for fun. This is not just so we can play with some tools. This is to further our connection to God. And the ultimate display of that is through worship, through the altar, through giving God what he deserves. So that intentionality, uh, the planning, is something that I hope we will value and translate into our everyday life even today in 2021. So if you're reading through this, and my Bible translated it the Feast of Shelters, your Bible might say the Feast of Tabernacles. Those are actually the same thing, and, and, and they're one of the three kind of major feasts and festivals that the Jewish people celebrated. Um, Sometimes it's translated the Feast of Shelters because what they actually did in practice was they actually brought out like tent shelter type things that they lived in for a period of time as a reminder of how their forefathers had lived during uh, Egyptian exile and when they had been in captivity and obviously their living con conditions were not great. But when you read about the, the, the tabernacle or the shelters, this is, they're the same thing. So as we continue reading in Exodus 3, we see that it says that they began, um, they, they offered the regular burnt offering, the appointed feasts, and then they begin to offer freely, free will offerings to God. Why is that significant? Well, you know, when you think back to the prior hundred years or so that they had been in captivity, um, especially in Persia and in Babylon, they were surrounded by every manner of God, little g, that you could imagine. I mean, you're talking about two cultures that uh, had many, 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 many different gods. Basically, anything you wanted to get into, you could find somebody to support that. Uh, but of course, they did not have a temple. They did not have an altar. So this entire time, they had really been void of offerings to God. So when it says that they resumed offering, what that really meant was that they started where generations past had left off. You know, they're now back in Jerusalem where they should be at the altar where they should be offering altar or they should be offering uh, offerings and they're now prepared to do that and so they're offering these regular offerings but it says they offer they also offered free will offerings which is which is really a beautiful thing and you know this this type of generosity is something that I want us to consider you know in many ways man maybe just in a few ways but in some ways our year in 2020 and and their returning to Jerusalem has a few things in common um, primarily of which you know in 2020 our year was not what we expected and we had things kind of that we probably if we're being honest had taken for granted stripped away you know we had to be away from each other in church for quite some time we weren't able to gather together we weren't able to do you know fellowship meals like we always have wanted to do we haven't been able to do all kinds of things and so when we rejoin back together we get the opportunity to resume that and i want you to notice the heart and the posture of them you know they've been away for all this time and one could very easily assume that you know they kind of had just grown out of the habit of offering offerings in the way that God commanded because they weren't able to physically. Um, you know, I don't know that anybody would necessarily blame them. You're in captivity in this foreign land that doesn't have all the proper resources for you to worship. So, you know, it would be natural to assume that they kind of just grew away from that. But do you notice that when they came back, when they were back in Jerusalem and had the opportunity to worship again, 
they jumped right back into it as if no time had ever left. It says they immediately resumed giving offerings to God, free will offerings. And this is just something that I hope that we take note of. You know, a lot of things in our world now, you know, we kind of have gotten into a habit of, you know, we were doing church in our PJs for a long time on Sunday morning. Um, You know, we didn't do X, Y, and Z. We weren't able to take the Lord's Supper together. We probably weren't giving offerings as regularly as we had done prior. And it's really easy to kind of get out of the habit of doing things that we used to do. But now we kind of are back, at least to some degree, in regular worship. And are we resuming those things cheerfully? Uh, Are we excited about resuming and taking the Lord's Supper together? Are we excited about singing together again? Are we excited about just being in church? Are we committed to being in person? Now, again... I know that there are reasons why some people need to stay at home right now. And, and again, I'm, I'm totally fine with that. The elders are okay with that. Everyone knows that this is a tough circumstance. But there's a fine line between I need to be away for a real reason and I need to be away because that's what I've done for the last nine months and that's just what's easier. And again, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not talking to any one person or any group in particular. I just want us to look at these folks and say, what did they do really well? And to me, what they did really well was they never lost sight of what was important. And when, when, when they had their first opportunity to join back and resume their, their standard practice of things, which meant worship, it meant burnt offerings, it meant free will offerings, it meant uh, observing these different feasts and festivals and things like that, that was all part of the old law. They jumped right back into it as if no time had passed. I pray that you and I will have the same urgency today, that when COVID-19 is well behind us, that we jump back into the way we were prior to COVID and we say, we're moving forward at breakneck speed. I'm ready to get back to the way things used to be, and I'm going to do the things I used to do, and I'm going to even do them better than before. That's really taking the heart of these people of, I'm going to do whatever I need to do as a means to worship God, and then when I have the opportunity to worship God, I'm not going to allow any anything to get in my way of doing the things that God would have me to do. We continue reading and we begin to see, starting in about verse 7, they begin to make preparations to rebuild the whole temple. And we see that it says that they hired masons and carpenters that they bartered to to get these people's services. It tells us that they got cedar logs from Lebanon. Um, Historically, we know that Lebanon and that region had terrific timber, which tells us that they wanted the very best materials that they possibly could get in order to rebuild this temple. We continue looking and it says that they were given permission by Cyrus king of Persia. We know some of this from our study of Nehemiah that the king of Persia had kind of greenlit this project. Um, Permission can get translated a couple ways. Another way you might think of this as is granted, Um, not just permission, but that the king had granted them access to, to protection, to money, to timber. So again, they're doing all of this with the green light from the king that had them in captivity at that time. So we look starting in about verse 8 through about verse 11 that work actually begins on the temple. And we know that they appointed the Levites um, from 20 years old and above to oversee the work. Now again, they brought back a very small fraction of the Levites that were still back in Persia. But the ones that were there, 20 years and up, they were used as kind of managers to oversee this entire project. Now, what you might find interesting, if you know your Old Testament history, then you know back in Numbers, the book of Numbers, um, the Levitical priesthood usually began at age 30. But if you look back in 1 Chronicles chapter 23, David actually kind of revised that law, um, and God was okay with that, to 20 years old. So we see here that when um, Zerubbabel and Jeshua were in charge of this project, they kind of adopted David's interpretation of Levitical service, and instituted 20 as that age as opposed to 30, which was older in the law. We know when we read it here in Scripture, it says when the builders had laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord. This was a huge thing. The priests actually came out in their ceremonial kind of garb. They had people there that were singing, that were uh, worshiping God. Because this was a huge thing that this was being laid. The temple was being rebuilt. I mean, this was so significant to God's people at that time. To, you know, that, that God's presence in their lives was physically being rebuilt. Let's continue to kind of connect the dots 
between Nehemiah and our rebuilding series in Ezra, they were physically rebuilding the temple, which signified a lot more than just this is a building. But it also, as we've already talked about, it uh, re-brought back their ability to worship. It re-brought back their ability to give. It brought back their ability to connect to God in a real way. So this foundation being laying is, is a beautiful thing that was very significant to the Jews back um, in Ezra's time. Starting in verse 12, we've kind of got some interesting, we've got some mixed reactions because you've got some of the older folks that had seen the original temple that were weeping over this. And then you've got some folks that were a little bit newer, that were a little younger, that were super excited. And I want to dive into kind of the differences there because there's been some questions as to why would the older folks be sad to see this built? So here's kind of my opinion as to why, and again, if we look back in um, Ezra chapter 2, 12 and 13, um, it says that the old men who had seen the first temple wept with a loud voice when the foundation of the temple was laid before their eyes, yet many shouted aloud with joy. Why is it that the older men would have been obviously sad to see this, even though it was a beautiful thing. One of the major theories here, this is one that I'm inclined to agree with, is that, remember, Solomon built the original temple, King Solomon, who was worth somewhere in the $100 billion range or more. I mean, Solomon was had a supernatural gift of wisdom that was given to him by God. He was David's son. He had money that is hard to even fathom. So the original temple we know from Scripture took between five and eight modern day equivalent of five to eight billion dollars to build the original temple. So a lot of people think that the older men that had seen the original temple wept like this because they recognized that it was almost impossible. Even with the resources of of Persia, it was really impossible to rebuild the temple to the splendor and the glory that it once had. They remember seeing this magnificent thing. You know, you imagine... Something, you know, we have, uh, you, you look around in today's world, you know, and you think about some of the palaces that, that exist today. Think about if those were knocked down and, and there just wasn't the resources to rebuild it. You know, it, it would almost make you sad. You know, you think about the White House, um, you know, think about the Biltmore House or something like that, that is just, it's, it's so grand, it's so beautiful. And if you didn't have the ability to rebuild that, what would you feel like? Realizing that there's kind of a finality to it. There's an absolute to it of, I'll never see this again, especially in that day and age where there was no cameras, there was no smartphones. You know, they only had their memories. There wasn't even a a picture of what it used to look like. They're only relying on what their mind's eye could produce. So most people think that they were they were sad, and and, and in a in a very real way, they had mixed emotions. They were sad because the old one was gone, and not only was it they remembered how beautiful it was, but they also saw how it ended. They were there, most of them were there when it was being just ransacked. And it, it, it hurt to see you know God's house, the temple that was so eloquently, beautifully built, go from what was at one point one of the wonders of the world to just literal rubble. I think the secondary part of this, and, and you can think and believe both of these. I don't think they really kind of contradict each other. But I think the other part of this is seeing this new temple again. It's beautiful in some ways because it's the rebuilding of God's people. But it also represents the decline of God's people. You know, again, God had told Israel that they were going to be put into exile and fall down in the world order because of them falling away from God and from his commands. So when the priest and the old men look at this temple and they see it in ruins, they they see what it used to be. They're sad about that. They remember it being destroyed. They're hurt about that. But then they also remember that the reason it was being destroyed to begin with is God's people had spiritually fallen away. So there was multiple layers to why these old men were were really kind of torn 
about how to feel about this. And then you continue reading, and of course there were many of, of the younger generation that were just joyful. You know, they had only ever seen exile, they hadn't seen Jerusalem the way it used to be, and all they see now is this hope, this rise of hope of, of rebuilding that they're able to return to their heritage, to the place that their forefathers were. Um, you know, and, and in a lot of ways, you know, we still have a similar thing here today of, you know, the older people among us have so much more experience, so much more, have lived through so much more that, you know, a lot of times, because history always does kind of repeat itself, even good things can have some sensitive or negative overtones to them because they remember the way it used to be or, or, or the way that something came to an end and they're seeing it re kind of revived. You know, it's, it's very much a mixed bag. And but, but the ultimate goal here, the ultimate overtone here is we are rebuilding in order to reconnect to God. And I hope that that is an attitude that we're willing to have even as we look in our series on Sunday morning of rebuild. You know, we're not rebuilding a temple, but we're very much rebuilding our lives of rebuilding our com uh, commitment to God, our commitment to the church, of you know rebuilding our family lives, our our friends, our so social everything. We're we're kind of rebuilding and we're kind of taking these shambles and putting it back together. And as I mentioned on Sunday, you know God is an expert, is a master of doing that very thing. Guys, I hope that you'll join me on Sunday morning as we dive into Nehemiah chapter 3. We got through chapter 2 last week. I hope you'll join me either online or in person. I can't wait to see you there.